praise the Lord. Dear friends, welcome to the study and reflections on the miracles or signs reported in the Bible. We have gone through the miracles reported in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. We saw the miracles performed by Jesus as reported by all the four evangelists and then for all the three evangelists. Now we started looking at the miracles reported only in the Gospel of Luke, of which the first one we saw in chapter 5, that is in relation to the call of the first disciples, a miraculous fishing reported only in Luke. Something similar we may see in the Gospel according to John, the last chapter, chapter 21, but it seems to be two different episodes. Anyhow, the first miracle is that of the miraculous uh, fishing. The second miracle reported only in Luke is in the chapter 7 that deals with the raising of a dead man, a young man who was dead and he was the only son of a widow. So the raising of the son of a widow reported in chapter 7 verses 11 to 17. Now let me first read the passage then we shall see what it all implies. Gospel according to St. Luke chapter 7 verses 11 to 17. Soon afterwards, he went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went with him. As he approached the gate of the town, a man who had died was being carried out. He was his mother's only son, and she was a widow. And with her, a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her and said to her, Do not weep. Then he came forward and touched the buyer, and the wearer stood still. And he said, Young man, I say to you, arise. The dead man sat up and began to speak, and Jesus gave him to his mother. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us, and God has looked favorably on his people. This word about him spread throughout Judea and all the surrounding country. This is the word of the Lord. The report of the miracle of raising of the son of a widow. As I mentioned in the beginning, this is a miracle reported only in the gospel according to Luke. The other three gospels have nothing to say about it. So there's something special in the gospel of Luke. Now let us see the position of this particular passage in the uh, gospel According to Luke. So when we study a passage, it is important to see the context in which that passage says, how it is related to the, the entire gospel, what is the role of this particular passage in this situation, what comes before and what comes after that. We know the gospel of Luke, as the gospel of Mark, is divided into three parts. Luke is structurally following the same uh, pattern as that of Mark. The, after the introduction, there is the Galilean ministry, then the journey to Jerusalem and the Jerusalem ministry. Here we are in the Galilean ministry uh, where Jesus called the disciples and after that there is a sermon in the plain. In the Gospel of Matthew, we have the Sermon on the Mount. Some, similar to that, we have a sermon of Jesus in the plain that is in chapter 6. That some, uh, somehow describes, sets forward the qualities, the nature and the conditions of the kingdom of heaven. That is in chapter 6. Immediately after that comes chapter 7 verses 1 to 10. That's the healing of a centurion servant in Capernaum. So healing of a person who was near death. And after this comes Jesus raising a young man who was being carried to the tomb, to the burial ground. And this takes place in the city called Nain. Nain is a town about 50 kilometers south of Capernaum. Jesus healed the centurion's servant in Capernaum and from there he walks 50 kilometers to come to this particular place just for one this, this purpose. So it is preceded by the healing and then what comes after that is the testimony to John the Baptist. John the Baptist had come to introduce Jesus, the Messiah, and now he sends the disciples to ask whether you are the one to come or not. So immediately after this incident, the answer is given, who is Jesus? There it is said in chapter 
7 verse 18 following what follows, the disciples of John reported all these things to John. And so John summoned two of his disciples and sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? So the, the raising of the son of the widow is placed in this context of the question. This presented as a sign of his identity, who Jesus is. And then what happens? When the men had come to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or are we to wait for another? Jesus had just then cured many people of diseases, plagues and evil spirits and had given sight to many who were blind. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. And as a conclusion, the poor have the good news brought to them. So raising the dead is presented as a definitive sign of the identity of Jesus. So the, this particular incident, Luke sets in such a way to show that who Jesus is. He is the one who was supposed to come. And the climax of all the healing miracles is that of raising of the dead. Now to see the passage in itself. It comes immediately after the healing of the centurion son and is in Nain. And there, see who are the characters. There is um, Jesus and a crowd. Jesus goes from Capernaum northward and a crowd is following him. One crowd led by Jesus and they come to the city gate of Nain. And at the same time, another crowd is coming. There, the crowd is taking a young dead person being carried to the tomb. So two processions. There is a crowd following Jesus and there is a crowd following the dead man. The two crowds or two groups meet at the city gate of Nain. Be interesting to reflect on it. A crowd following Jesus, the source of life, and the another crowd following a dead man, life and death, meet at the city gate. It would seem Jesus came all the way, walking 50 kilometers, just for this particular purpose, to meet this dead man at the gate of the city. And they meet. So that is where it starts, the meeting of life and death. Jesus, the source of life, and the person who has been in the grips of death, who had been dead and is being taken to the burial ground. And then what happens? The situation is presented here. He was his mother's only son and he was, she was a widow and with her was a large crowd from the town. When the Lord saw her, he had compassion for her. That's the first thing. Two things we had to keep in mind. Jesus saw her and he had compassion. So the aspect of seeing is given great importance in the Bible. Jesus saw her again and again. He sees a person standing. He sees a person in need. And later in the same chapter, Jesus would ask the Pharisee who invited Jesus to the dinner and who was criticizing Jesus in his mind because he was allowing a sinful woman to weep at his feet, anoint the feet with the ointment, perfume, etc. And he was having very bad thoughts about it. If he were a prophet, he would have known. So Jesus saw the heart of the Pharisee and asked, do you see this woman? The question is important to ask. Jesus saw. Jesus saw this is a person and he knows she is a widow and the only son of that widow is dead. We know the situation in Palestine of the widows. The women as such is very bad. A woman is always dependent on the man, either the father, when he, she's a child she, or girl, she's dependent on the father. When she is married, dependent on the husband. And if the husband dies, dependent on the son. Again, to a widow as such is considered with a great disrespect because it is believed that the untimely death of the husband is somehow due to the sin of the widow, a prejudice in fact. So this is a woman who had lost everything she had. She had lost her husband and the only sustenance, only one to protect her was her son and that young son is also lost. A person in total is lost. A person in total misery. A woman, first of all, a widow and now 
a widow with a son who is dead. So now Jesus saw her. That is first thing. And then what does that side bring in? Had compassion. And he had compassion on her. A second thing. So that is what Jesus is. Compassion of God incarnate. Jesus has compassion. Jesus sees. Jesus sees the need of the people. Jesus sees the misery of the person. And he has compassion. Others would have criticized it because your fault that you lost your husband and you lo now you lost your son. Could be. Jesus doesn't take it that way. Here stands a person really miserable who needs help, who needs protection. So compassion goes out of him. The Hebrew word for compassion is rahamim. In the Greek, it is translated into splankne chain. Splankne means the liver, the inner organs. So send a feeling that you have, a, you have when you see something very miserable or something shocking that your, your stomach is somehow revolting, so to say, a kind of grip in the stomach. And the Hebrew word rahamim comes from the word rechem. Rechem means womb. So rahamim is the feeling, the attitude the sense of the woman, of the mother towards his, her unborn child. So this is the feeling of a mother, God, who is father and mother. Jesus, now the incarnate compassion of God, he had compassion. And that start, uh, sets him move all the rest of the work. He had compassion to her and said to her, what does, he say, what does he say? Do not weep. That's something we all say. You know, when you see somebody cry, miserable, please don't weep. Who has the right to ask, tell a person not to weep? Do you know why that person is weeping? Why he or she is crying? And what right do you have to say not to weep? Weeping is a kind of release. If the tears are flowing out, your heart may not break. And if you stop the tears, maybe there's a heartbreak coming in. So Jesus tells, it's not a kind of uh, just platitude, just telling a compassionate word, no. Don't weep. And he knows why. She has lost the son and he is going to lead the, the son back to her. So she, he is going to take away the root of the, the suffering. So when he says, don't weep, it is not just a platitude, it's not just a compassionate, comforting word. It is a word that is effective, creative and see what happens next. So he said, don't weep. Then he came forward and touched the buyer, and the bearers stood still. The body was being carried uh, away into the burial ground, and he stands at the gate, and the bearers stand still. Now, what does he say? Young man, I say to you, arise. Young man, I say to you, arise. He's not just standing up, rising. A person who is dead, can he hear? You could ask, how can he say, this is dead and he's gone? No. Jesus said, arise. And this is the author of life. I am the light of the world. I am the life. Light and life. The one who is life giving God incarnate tells the person, arise. And he rose. So this is also indicating to another great resurrection that will come after three days of the death of Jesus, anticipating his resurrection and also a resurrection that all of us will be having the last day. So this is a symbolic undertaking. It's a kind of anticipation and indication of that life. And he rose. The dead man sat up and began to speak. And Jesus gave him to his mother. He sat up and began to speak. We don't know what he spoke. This is a sign that he's alive. He's no more dead. A person who was supposed to be dead, who was really dead and gone, but now he comes back. And he stands up or sits up and stands up and speaks. And Jesus gave him to his mother. So what he said to the mother, don't weep, has become now actual. There is no reason for you to weep. Look, your son is alive. And gave the son back to her. Fear seized all of them, and they glorified God, saying, A great prophet has risen among us. First of all, why fear? Should they have been happy? So what is the fear here? It's not a fear that somehow threatens you to destroy. It is a fear that you feel the presence of God. That is quite normal. You see something so exceptional, everybody realizes that this is not an ordinary human being that stands. 
a person who can raise the dead person from uh, from death to life is the incarnate he is the presence manifestation of god that all inspiring presence that's being said and then what do they say? they glorified god and here not a great prophet has risen among us and god has looked favorably on his people two us proclamations one a great prophet has risen in our midst jesus is presented as a prophet and this is one thing luke is takes special uh, gives special attention to present jesus as a prophet or the prophet this is one of the basic christological themes in the gospel of luke jesus the prophet when he comes to nazareth so that portrayed in the gospel all the three gospels jesus came to nazareth but luke makes this uh, the visit of jesus to nazareth as a kind of manifesto presenting himself for the first time to the community who he is and what he is telling and they are quoting from isaiah 61 12 jesus presents himself as the prophet whom they were expecting the spirit of the lord is upon me he has anointed me he has sent me to proclaim the good news to the poor to liberty to the hop- captives freedom to the oppressed so jesus present and then he goes on to say today in your hearing the scripture has been fulfilled that is in chapter 4 luke 21 that jesus presents himself as the fulfillment of the prophecy which was beyond to us about the eschatological prophet means the one who is to come at the end of the age a prophet who is to introduce inaugurate the end time that's how luke starts presenting jesus so the manifest jesus presents his manifest to he presents himself as the prophet and then here comes the people acclaim him a great prophet something similar to elijah there is a lot of similarity between uh, this episode and uh, and elijah raising the son of the widow of sarephath they are also in comparison with the word of elijah the, the dead boy comes to life and here jesus is presented as the new elijah this is a popular opinion that jesus is a great prophet and the same popular opinion is reported by the disciples when jesus asked them the question at caesarea philippi once he was once when jesus was praying alone with only the disciples near him he asked who do the crowd say that i am they answered John the Baptist but others Elijah still others that one of the ancient prophets has risen so the crowd sees Jesus as a prophet later on at the at the end after the death and resurrection of Jesus the disciples were going away from Jerusalem disappointed and afraid and Jesus came as an unknown companion and on the way Jesus asked him what are you speaking about and they tell about to Jesus about the person how the how the disciples understood jesus and that is reported in chapter 24 he asked them what things they spread the thing about jesus of nazareth who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before god and all the people so even after the death the disciples um, entertained this faith they had this faith that jesus was the prophet but something went wrong jesus himself presented as the prophet in chapter 13 of gospel of luke chapter 13 then he said to them go and tell that fox for me listen i am casting out demons and performing cures today and tomorrow and on the third day i finish my work yet today and tomorrow and the next day i must go on my way because it is impossible for a prophet to be killed outside of jerusalem It is impossible for a prophet to be killed out of Jerusalem. So Jesus presents himself as a prophet who was be killed in Jerusalem. So this is a acclamation reported by the by Luke in the context of the raising of the the son of a widow that Jesus is the prophet. That's one thing. So the people believe, understand, accept him as the prophet. And the second, what is this prophet? What does it mean? God has looked. favorably on his people in fact it's not look favorably god has visited his people visiting can be favorable okay so god has visited his people present people understand jesus as the presence of god as the visit of god the one who brings life so the story of the raising of the son of a widow of nain presents as the compassionate 
touch of Jesus, Jesus sees. He saw, he had compassion, and he said, don't weep. And he takes away, removes the reason for the weeping. And this is what today also happens. Remember, God sees you. He sees everything. He sees your heart. Whether you are happy, you are sorrowful, oppressed, deprived of things, unhappy. God sees, and Jesus is the eye of God. Jesus sees, and he looks with compassion, not with hatred. So this we have to keep in mind. God looks us with compassion, knowing what we are going through, what we are in need. So his compassion, and this compassion is not an empty word of don't weep. So when he says don't weep, know for sure he will remove the reason for you are weeping. So let us take this as an example of God's compassionate word to us. Don't weep. Because God will remove the reason why you are weeping. All that happens in our life has to be taken as part and parcel of our, the plan of God for us. And for this widow, this was an occasion to realize, recognize God's compassionate love for her by raising the child. This is not that every day is happening. But this also an indication that death is not the end. Nothing ends with death. Death is only the beginning. And we are all called to an eternal life where we'll be always with God. And this is what the people say, a great prophet has risen now. Jesus is the prophet who proclaims the good news of God's love, God's kingdom, and God is visiting us today, now. As you listen to the word, he is visiting you. He is taking away the reason for your, weep, for your pain, your sadness, your sorrow, and believe. Jesus is telling, don't weep. And he's also telling, young man, I tell you, get up. Don't lie down here. You have to get up. You have to work. You have to ex experience God's love and proclaim it to others. This is also a word to the youth all through. Young man, get up and speak. Speak what you have felt, what you have seen. Speak the experience you have of God's compassion. Just conclude with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for visiting us through Jesus Christ, who saw the misery, the sorrow of the persons, who had compassion and brought the dead man back to life. Father, we believe this is only a symptom, some day promise of what is going to happen to all of us, a life eternal, a life with you for always, forever. And this will be also with the resurrection at the end of the world. But also today, you are asking us, don't weep, get up and speak. Father, enable us to experience your love and share it with courage and sincerity to all whom we meet. We make this prayer through Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.